Oh well, apologies if this is going to be a little too slow for some of the more advanced people with 2001, but this is really meant for introductory and intermediate viewers. So without further ado, let's get to it. So what is 2001? Really, it's two films at once. It's a conspiracy thriller, and it's a mythic documentary about the search for God and or alien intelligence. If you go back to the original version of the script, Kubrick gave very much more clear kind of conspiracy narrative with a voiceover explicitly saying that there was a lot of Cold War uh, slash colonial politics occurring in this very dystopian future, but he pulled out the dialogue. If you look closely, he only um, has, you know, no voiceover in three films. For the most part, he does rely on voiceover, but for 2001, he decided to get rid of it, as well as with a lot of dialogue, which I think has ended up confusing people. But it's bare essentials. I think we all know the plot. Um, the apes seem to be doing well, but they're being victimized by these larger predators. So the monolith gives them a sort of evolutionary head start, but it's a paradox because it gives them language and, a, you know, this human mind, but it also gives them access to weaponry, which we, they use against one another. And then the match cut happens, which we jump a huge amount of time, but man's essential nature has not changed. He's still fighting for resources. There's competition between the Soviet Union and America, Germany, and these other countries. Now, the match cut goes to a space station, but that's really supposed to be a weapons station, but Kubrick made it much more ambiguous in the final cut. But yeah, we're supposed to go from weapon to weapon in the future. But he, again, made things much more ambiguous, but the basic um, outline of the conspiracy narrative is still there. So when the monolith is discovered again, the U.S. government uh, very quickly tries to cover up its existence. And he's also simultaneously making all these kind of ironic, kind of black comedy observations that even in the future people are obsessed with you know, the minutia of space travel, calling their relatives, and so on and so forth. So all these technological advances have not really improved mankind's kind of basic biological structure. So we see Floyd trying to cover up the monolith, and they obviously don't succeed because it's much more powerful than them. And then the narrative jumps to uh, Bowman on the discovery uh, and what's going to go on between them and Hal. Now, Hal's breakdown is genuinely a paradox. We don't really know what happened either. Hal was told explicitly to kill the astronauts to keep the monolith a secret, and or he just had a kind of breakdown in his programming because he makes a simple mistake. If you look very closely at the chess game, he actually does make a very simple mistake, but it presumably had a systemic effect on his system, and that's why he chooses to kill the astronauts. Um, of course, we know that they survive. One of them dies, but Bowman uh, lives, and he lives to defeat Hal. Now, he doesn't kill Hal. A lot of people think he destroys Hal. He just shuts him down. But then he makes his discovery of the monolith, and this is, I think, where interpretations are very much clashing in terms of, well, what exactly is going on? Well, he enters the Stargate, and he ends up in this weird 17th century room, uh, and people are wondering, well, why is this happening, and how is he able to look at himself? Because he ages rapidly, and then he turns into an old man, and then he touches the monolith. Now, most people kind of know what happens afterwards. He becomes transformed into the Star Child. So the early portion is the monolith transforms, uh, you know, apes into men, and then the monolith transforms men into a superman at the end. But the sort of final concluding uh, section still confuse people. I think the way to solve the kind of paradox with Bowman is pretty simple. Bowman has basically either been cloned or there is kind of alternate realities going on. So when he sees himself aging in the room, we're looking not at one Bowman in two different time periods, but two different Bowman. So Bowman 1 is looking at Bowman 2. Now, how long has have these two Bowman been there, or what is their uh, purpose? That's not clear. Presumably the aliens just, for whatever reason, cloned Bowman or had him in a kind of time loop, and for whatever reason they decide to get him out of the loop and let him touch the monolith and advance in terms of humanity's uh, mental progress. So a lot of things can be explained by, you know, these kind of uh, implied information off screen. And we do have some evidence, like Kubrick did actually create the aliens, uh, but at the last minute decided not to use them. He wasn't impressed with the special effects. He thought anything that sort of was remotely anthropological would be too pointing to the audience. So we never see the aliens uh, up close. We only see them sort of like by their implied effects on the narrative. But that's what's occurring. The aliens are somehow experimenting with Bowman, but they're allowing him to become a Superman. So that's 2001 in a nutshell. It's a very religious film trying to, through using documentary techniques to look into the future of what if uh, human life comes in contact with alien intelligence and how that's going to impact us in terms of our society and culture. And of course, there's a lot of references to Nietzsche and his philosophy, but its bare structure is pretty understandable, um, even without these explicit verbal or um, kind of obvious visual symbols. 
let me just make some final remarks to sort of clarify, I think, some of the added confusion, because color for Kubrick works very differently than other directors, whereas most directors use black to signify darkness or death or things like that. Uh, black for Kubrick is actually a positive color. It signifies uh, searching or life or mental activity, but white signifies death or the loss of meaning, things like that. So the early scenes when we see all these people in white corridors and these white space stations, we're not supposed to think they're in a healthy environment, but quite the opposite, that they're in a kind of death-filled environment, uh, and but they don't recognize it. There's also some interesting puns he uses with the visual style, because if you look closely when the these so-called early sections with the ape creatures, they're staring at the camera. You know, at, at a various points in time, the characters look directly into the camera, so they're sort of breaking the fourth wall, and he's sort of, uh, again, emphasizing that this is a film. This has never been more than what it is. It is a fictional reconstruction of a certain myth he has created, but you're never supposed to take it for granted that it is a realistic, real, true-to-life documentary about space travel. It's just, all the realism is just meant to be in service of this mythic documentary, and the conspiracy narrative is meant to, you know, move the plot along to keep people excited. So that's in it in a nutshell. It's basically just a conspiracy thriller slash religious film with all these pretensions to be like Nietzsche and uh, thinking through the uh, death of God or the rebirth of God, etc., etc. So to me, it's not as puzzling as his other films like The Killing or The Shining or Eyes Wide Shut, where he would admit that the paradoxes are very powerful and it's very hard to get a single interpretation. But if you're ever puzzled about what 2001 was or is, it's just about the search for meaning of life by encountering a godlike and or alien intelligence. And the plot is basically pointless. It's just meant to get to that uh, philosophical point about expanding our minds and consciousness and moving beyond our certain current uh, set of concepts of what we think human life is or should be. All right, this has been 2001 Analyzed. If you like the content, please, please, please hit the like button uh, and or subscribe below. Thanks for listening.